All right. So good. I was going to say good morning, and it's definitely not morning. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's good to see that th those of you that I can see and those of you that I can't see, but just your names. I just want to welcome you um, to this evening with the loss program, um, talking about the nervous system in relationship um, to grief. So just a couple of things I want to mention before we uh, get started um, and just give you a little bit of a sense of the layout of tonight. Um, that is, first of all, um, we're going to record. So um, if at any, if, if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn your camera off. Um, the other thing is, is we're going to pause the recording um, at different points for like sharing and stuff. So just so you know what, what we're gonna do our best to maintain the privacy of everybody. But there are some people who have asked for the recording um, because they can't be here tonight. So we wanted to be able to honor um, that request as well. Um, and then the second thing is, is that the way the format will go is that there will be some didactic, didactic some presentation some practice just to get a sense of what I'm actually talking about in your body. Um, and then there will also be plenty of time for discussion and questions. And so the way I'd like to handle um, discussions and questions is that as I'm talking, um, as I'm presenting, as things are coming up, if you have a question about something that I'm talking about in that moment, um, please raise your hand. Um, you can use the the, uh, the reaction. Um, just raise your hand. Or if that doesn't work, you're you're also welcome to kind of just chime in if you if I don't see your hand up. Um, and the reason that I want um, just to be really explicit and clear about this is because for this could be new information, and if if there's if I've missed something or if I haven't explained something and if it didn't land well or if it didn't it, if you had a question I can guarantee you that someone else is probably um I can guarantee you most likely someone else that has the same question so if you would uh just um ask for the group I would really appreciate it um and it will also help um all um it will also help to keep the conversation to what's also important for everybody here. So um, if we could all make that commitment to one another, that, that would be great. Um, all right, hold on one second. I just, okay, Emily, I just saw you coming into the waiting room. I just wanna make sure you're in there. Okay, I think we're good. Um, so tonight, um, I'm just gonna pull up my PowerPoint here. Um, before before we go into one of the practices. So the overview of today is really understanding what the nervous system is um, and defining trauma and how it plays a role in our grief and why it matters. Um, and I think one of the most important pieces of this is um, before we kind of get in, into it is that we have the experience of grief and loss. There's no question about that. And there is a physiological reaction um, through the nervous system, through, hormo um, uh, through the hormones, through chemicals, and through the brain structure that is also at play in the grieving process. And so you have these different systems or different experiences um, that are impacted and affected by the by the loss and and the grieving process and so I think I think and what um, research is showing us and and telling us is that it's helpful to have this kind of bigger picture almost to take a little bit of a step back and look at what's happening overall to our inner being. And when I say inner being or inner body, I mean what's happening inside of us. Um, so that I kind of want to, I want to be able to unpack that for you. And, you know, even it doesn't matter where you are um, in the grieving process is that 
the, the experience of the nervous system um, impacts us every day in different ways. And it will impact us whether the, the grief is more acute and um, close or whether the grief or the loss is further out. So um, I hope that by the end of our session today, that one, that you have an understanding of what's happening you know, physio physiologically in relationship to the nervous system and how your body is, how your body is responding but also that you might have a couple of um, tools, if you'd like, or reflections that you can put in your backpack um, of self-care that might help to just regulate or care for, for your inner body. Um, and then the last thing that I think is, I find to be really um, important, not just in relationship to grief, but in general, is how our nervous system and what's happening with us is also influenced and is impacted by those that we are in relationship with. So for example, if I'm what's considered activated and I'm experiencing or processing my grief in one way, that may not be the way that the person who I'm in relationship with or family relationships or friends, how they're experiencing it. And so there sometimes can be a disconnect, which further exacerbates the um, parts of our nervous system. So I, I, I think that while grief is very personal and um, it's very individual, um, the also the and there's the and right and the and is that we're also relational human beings and um, we're in relationship with people so um, I just wanted to um, include that um, and then if there's anything I'm going to just move my PowerPoint down here so if there's anything that comes up or any questions that just kind of like um, you know are even here in the foreground, like, oh, I really hope that she addresses this, or I hope she addresses this. Just pop that into the chat, and then um, we'll, I will make sure to do my best. And I know Emily's here, who's a wonderful co-facilitator. She'll help um, to make sure that those questions are answered. All right, does that sound like a plan <laughs> for those of you that I can see? All right. Um, Okay, so what I'd first like to do, um, and that is um, just start with what's called a resource or, an, or um, an orienting practice. And, you know, one of the reasons that, I, that I'm incorporating the, some practices or tools, if you will, um, into, into this presentation is because it can be great to understand it intellectually, right? Like I, you know, just to understand how this all works and all the pieces of it, but it can be very different to, um, to experience how we can actually take care of ourselves or how we can regulate or how we can understand the different um, dynamic, the, the dynamic of our nervous systems. So um, I just saw something that pop up. So let me just see. Um, yes, I absolutely will do that, Megan. Um, Thank you. I am cooking. So uh, yeah, that was no, a question enjoy. for later. Enjoy. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Such a great, great question. So, so yes. Okay. Um, so um, going back to where I, so orienting. So yes, so, um, so incorporating these practices is that, so it's one thing to have it in our minds to understand it. And then it's another thing to actually say, okay, so this is what this means on a somatic or on a, um, on a felt sense. And I wanna preface this before we even start going into this, is that some of these practices, some of these suggestions are just that. They're just suggestions. 
And some may like something might resonate with you. Some small little piece of a practice might say like, oh, right. That feels so good and so right. And there might be something that I suggest that I offer as an invitation that you're like, no, doesn't feel, doesn't, doesn't, don't connect with it, don't like it, doesn't make sense, whatever, whatever other, you know, ways you would describe it. And I really want to give you permission that that is okay. And that not everything is going to feel the same for everybody because most of us are in different places in our nervous system, right? So what I need or what might be helpful if I'm in a hyper state of arousal or agitated, anxious, proliferating thoughts, a lot of restless energy is going to be very different from someone who might be more low or in what's called like a hypo aroused state where they're depleted or feel heavy and can't really, don't feel like moving very much. So the way in, so what one person needs is going to be very different. So I just want to like be really clear and transparent about that, that um, these are all just suggestions. And one, if, even if there's just one little piece that you take away or something that you can do, consider that a success, right? So it doesn't, we don't have to come away with like 20 different things or you're not even gonna get 20 different things, but like 10 different things because it just, what's most important is that you just, you do what's right for you and you practice what what is most helpful to you, even if it's something like looking up into the sky, okay? So I just really, it's such an important point and this is the last thing I'll say before we um, head into the orienting practice. And that is, you know, I think we, we, we have so much access to so much information. We have so much access to so many strategies of the way to live, the way to be mindful, the way to process grief, the way to, to live, like just, you know, the list is endless. And, you know, I don't think we need all of those lists. And I don't think we need 50 things that we need to be doing or even 15 things for that matter. If we just have a collection of things that um, are really nourishing and take care of us, that's really all, all we need to rely on. So um, I just wanna give you know an invitation and permission for, for you to, um, just to fill your backpack lightly and not feel like it has to be full of lots of bells and whistles and, and tools. So, all right. So to begin with, um, and again, well, most of you have your camera off, but um, this is a practice that's called orienting, okay? And so I'm gonna give just a little bit of background so you have an, a sense of the purpose of orienting and that, um, Often when there is trauma, um, a traumatic loss, especially um, in, in the context of um, tonight's presentation, is that we can experience something which is just called um, flooding, right? And just like we are completely disoriented, like where are we? What's happening? I'm at the grocery store, but I, the, the lights are so bright, the sounds are so loud, and I have no orientation to where I am. Or you could be at the, the sink and you're just doing something, washing the dishes, cooking, and all of a sudden get flooded with sounds or flashbacks or uh, memories or um, feeling, right? And so what happens, right, is that we don't we lose our sense of orientation. We lose our sense of where we are in time and place. And the experience can be overwhelming or it can flood us um, to just kind of lose where we are. So this practice of orientation helps for us to, um, 
to do, just do that, right? To orient, to notice what's happening in our surrounding and to use our senses. So nobody has to know that you're even doing this, right? Um, and you can do it anywhere, right? You don't have, it doesn't have to be in any uh, certain conditions, right? So to do this, it's super simple. And that is just to look around your space just to notice what you see, okay? So it might be something so simple like, um, you know, just the colors of a blanket or the light filtering in through a window. Um, it might just be like a glass of water, just noticing the water, right? Or colors on the wall. Right? Or maybe even like a picture that you like seeing. So just take a couple of moments and just to notice what you see. And then we're going to shift to notice what you hear. So maybe my voice, you might notice subtle sounds of maybe the humming of an air conditioner. There might be some noises outside in the distance. Right? So just noticing what you hear. And some of the sounds might be pleasant or neutral. Some of the sounds might be unpleasant. And then shifting your attention to touch. So, you know, all of us kind of resonate with certain senses. So for me, I, I really like touch. So notice just like what's around you. You know, even if something as simple, if you're sitting just the fabric of the chair or even the fabric of your clothes, or maybe reaching out and touching something in front of you. You know, I, I don't know why I have the image of the kitchen table, but the steadiness of, uh, you know, your countertop or a, a grocery cart. Okay, the handles are right here in front of me. I can feel I'm just touching something stable and solid. Or maybe something soft. And then begin to bring your attention to, uh, to smell, to sense. And you might notice that there's something pleasant that is around. And sometimes we notice unpleasant scents. And then gradually bring your attention to taste. So sometimes there's the, the rem, remnants of some, drinking something or eating something earlier. You might even notice sometimes you know, the mouth feels moist or dry. And then gradually just bring your attention to the space around you again. And just notice, like, you know, there's nothing we're expecting, right? But just notice, like, how that feels for you, just to bring your attention to where you are. And just how this, you know, short, orienting or resourcing practice, how you feel afterwards.
And I'd be curious if just a couple of people wouldn't mind either sharing, just you don't have to have your camera on, um, but just sharing how that was or just putting a couple words in the chat just to, for all of us, just to connect over how this felt and hope that, you know, I, it's like sometimes if I'm not doing this all the time, I can sometimes like forget. So please bear with me. Um, Emily, so share screen. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Did you find it, Carly? Yeah. Okay. Is it up? Um, yes, it's up. Okay. Oh, and now I need to do um, slideshow? Yes. Okay. Exactly. You can never do things without presenter view, without other people. Okay. Is that right? No. Um, I think I presenter know. view shows us your slides. I think just play from start. Okay. There we yeah. Go. Okay. There we go. All right. So you can see, that. everyone can see that. Okay. So I already went over the overview. Okay. I'm going to just move that. Okay. So, okay. So defining the nervous system. So I'd like to just start off and just uh, defining this. And this was a definition I, that I um, kind of pulled together with different people and my own experience and the way that I, I feel like it, um, it, it best communicates um, the way that I'm gonna be teaching and presenting this information tonight. So the nervous system is the control center of the body. It sends signals and response or reaction to the way the body interprets life experiences, okay? So we experience something in our life and our body responds and it informs the way that we should respond or react. Often when the nervous system is being taught about in, I would say like psychology or um, anything about um, physiology of the body is that they talk about like, you know, if a, if an animal or if, if a child, if a child runs out into the street, right? Like there's this, there's this automatic reaction to move towards the child to rescue the child, right? As opposed to, for example, seeing like when we see like a sky, a sunset or something, there, there's a response to the way that the body interprets that experience. Um, and that's filtered through the nervous system, okay? So just a very simple, but, but you know, I am one for simplicity because that's just kind of how my brain works and how I, I, I best understand things. So, um, so that's just really, you know, if you're gonna remember anything from the nervous system, how the body responds or reacts um, to life's experiences. Okay, so hold on. Whoops, I have to scooch you guys here. All right, up. Oh, oops. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is a healthy, what's considered a healthy nervous system, and this is in all of us. Okay, so there, I there's this line. There's a fluid line that moves from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. So. I always, the way that I remember, I could never remember this. And I, I remembered parasympathetic, parasympathetic being more peaceful. Um, and then I didn't have anything for sympathetic, but there's the difference between being activated, aroused and activated, and then being more settled. This is important to know is that the nervous system is fluid, which means that it fluctuates in a day, in a day, even in our time here together, the nervous system will have, you know, somewhat of a fluctu of, of a fluctuation. So it's not to be constantly like flat or constantly like linear, or maybe not linear is the right word, but constantly like even there's fluctuations in it. And our nervous system responds to the life experiences that we have, okay? Um, all right, so I'm gonna, here we go. 
Okay. We're going to come back to the nervous system, but first I want to define the working definitions of trauma. Okay. So I know that you all can read, but I'm going to um, read them out loud just in case um, you're not at the screen. Okay. So any unbearable emotional or somatic experience that overwhelms or threatens our capacity to feel safe. Um, trauma can be defined as any unresolved, unautonomic nervous system response. It's about the nervous system's response to an event, not necessarily the event itself. Okay. And then the third one is uh, Judith Herman, and I have the, uh, the, the authors here too. Uh, traumatic events are extraordinary, not because they occur rarely, but rather because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. Trauma is specifically an event that overwhelms the central nervous system, altering the way we process and recall memories. Trauma is not the story of something that happened back then. It's the current imprint of that pain, horror, and fear living inside people, okay? So these are all people, Malakata, Peter Levine, Judith Herman, Bessel van der Kolk, who are um, really involved in the uh, trauma work, uh, trauma work today. They've been in, um, yeah, in the field for, for many years. So here, everyone is referring to life experience in some way and how it impacts the nervous system. So when we think about traumatic loss, there's no way that the nervous system is not significantly impacted by what we have, what we've experienced, okay? So we're gonna move on here now. Um, I'm gonna go one more, okay, because this is, this is important here, okay. So if you bring your attention to the gray fluid line of what we saw at the beginning, which was considered a healthy nervous system, right? We see that we're moving in that, what's called the quote unquote normal range. So then you can see kind of with the red lightning bolt is that we're in the normal range and then all of a sudden a traumatic event happens, okay? The traumatic event takes us out of the range, okay? Now, I think this is really important, uh, an important point. The way, uh, the, the way that we, or the degree of which we are out of the normal, the normal range has a host of factors that are, you know, the way that we're raised, a part of our temperament, other life experiences that we've had. So for some of us, we can experience a traumatic event and we can stabilize, you know, relatively, I say quickly, but quickly in a time, you know, quickly can mean different things for different people. And for others of us, we can get into a part of the nervous system where we get stuck, which often happens with trauma and tra traumatic grief, traumatic loss. Okay. So there's this, and I, I really I love this graph, um, this diagram because it shows that how when we get stuck on or stuck off, we're out of the normal range, okay? So what does that mean when we get stuck on or stuck off of the normal range? And this is what I think would be helpful to, to pay attention to in just reflecting in your own experience, okay? And that you don't have to, I'm gonna to go over it specifically, but you also don't have to be only stuck on or stuck off. You can move between the two. 
So you can be in stuck on for a period of time and then you can move into stuck off or vice versa. That's part of the disorientation and the, the, the difficulty when there is um, symptoms of traumatic stress is that we're moving or we're vacillating between extremes. So it can feel almost kind of like this whiplash, like here today, I'm in this flat effect of depression. And now tomorrow, or when I go to sleep, I'm in, I feel anxious and panicked. So let's take a look and look at what the stuck on um, symptoms are. I, I think it's important just to, to name them. Excuse me. So anxiety, panic hyperactivity, exaggerated startle, inability to relax, restlessness, hypervigilance, digestive problems, emotional flooding, chronic pain, sleeplessness, hostility, and rage, hostility, rage, okay? I also wanna point out none of these are bad because we, we live in a culture that says like, if I'm feeling anxious, if I'm restless, if, I'm, if I have flooding, if there's chronic pain, that I'm somehow doing something wrong or something about me isn't doing something right or we, you know, I'm, I'm bad in some way. And if we can look at these symptoms as the intelligence of the body saying, I'm suffering, I'm having a hard time. This is the way that my body is responding. Then we, be, we can, there's an invitation that there is an understanding to what's unfolding rather than something is, um, that something's wrong with you. So if we look at the stuck off position, we see that there's depression, flat affect, lethargy, feeling of deadness, exhaustion, chronic fatigue, disorientation, disconnection, disassociation, complex syndromes, pain, low blood pressure, and poor digestive by digestion, mostly um, constipation or like an irritable bowel and a fluctuating between um, both extremes with the um, digestion, right? And again, if we look at the body as an intelligent or wise reflection or um, information system, the, those symptoms are telling us something is happening here. Something, something's, something's amiss. There's, suffer, there's suffering happening, right? So they're all in the, in the, the body's intelligence. So what I'd like to do, I'm going to stop the share for a second, because I think that this is a really um, important piece. Um, and if anyone needs to see that again, I can put it up. But what I wanted to, what I want to ask um, is where people have a tendency in their own experience, whether it's present day or whether whether it was in the past, but where you have a tendency to, to live in your nervous system, you know, in that either hyper aroused, hypo aroused, you know, kind of that fluctuation. So, you know, when you, sh when you share, when you come forward, you really, um, you really help and support others. So I just saw a little thing is this is to also normalize that this just basically that is that this is this is this is normal and that um, this is unfortunately part of um, the pro the process. So thank you, Mary. Um, okay, Judy, to our own process and grief, and you bring up without knowing it, you bring up a really important point. Okay, and we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to it now because you just spoke and then I'm going to um, speak a little bit more in detail, but 
what we're what what kind what what we begin to see is that if we're feeling low or we don't want to go outside the kind of natural anecdote is to say we'll go out right don't, if i don't want to be with people be with people right that's the that's the remedy is the the opposite from this perspective I, my, and my experience and, and the way that I kind of, view, and not in the way that I understand the nervous system is that the opposite is not always what we need in a full dose. And that there, I love this word, it's titrate and that it's just a little bit, right? So maybe we don't go to the grocery store or maybe we don't go to our, the family party but maybe going out is just sitting outside of our house and having a cup of tea. Or maybe it's walking around the block. Or maybe it's just looking outside the window. Right? So like for another example might be like lethargy is that we, we often think like, oh, I'm supposed to go run five miles or go do active aerobic exercise. That can actually be too much on the system and harmful for the system. So maybe it's just walking up and down the stairs or maybe it's walking around the block. So it might be something as just an, just an invitation to think about a small dose. And it might not be the right time. And you get to choose that. And there's no timeline of when that's supposed to happen or how that's supposed to happen. Did you? Are you on mute? Yeah, you're on mute, Judy. Megan, hi, Megan. Um, I know there isn't one answer for all, but does the trauma response include both sides or this on and off? Did I, I think I answered that question, but- um, Yes, I think Carly, that question came in right before you covered the topic, oh, actually. Okay, it was very so timely. We on, okay, yeah. we were on the same, uh, the same wave, wavelength, okay. It was um, the diagram because it showed it going up and down and I just didn't know if it's- It does fluctuate and we can be in a heightened state of the hyper arousal and then eventually we crash because the, the, the hyper aroused state takes a lot of energy. And then we can be in that kind of uh, hypo aroused. And then all of a sudden it's like the hypo arousal, just it's like, it needs to move, the energy needs to move. And so it moves in direct opposition to the hypo aroused. So if there's like a lot of um, if there's a significant amount of like hypo aroused energy, then it it is in ex in in direct opposition to it. So it it like then is that much intensified, which is why you have the extremes. So if there's a lot of hypo hyper excuse me arousal, then there's the tendency to crash pretty low because it's in direct op direct opposition to that. Does that? makes sense does that help clarify yeah it does it does thank you yeah and i just want to say because i think this is important we also just have tendencies some of us are naturally more inclined towards the hyper and some of us are more inclined to the hypo in the normal state in the normal state and then when you add a layer of trauma then the then the state that is most familiar and conditioned in our, in our DNA and our personality will most likely kind of move in that direction. Okay. Um, okay. 
So Susan asked all the time, endlessly tired. I feel an adrenal peak when I get anxious for even when something good happens and it brings more exhaustion in its wake. This is, yeah, exactly, um, Susan, what I was just, uh, was just speaking, what I was just speaking to. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about in a couple of minutes is how we can bring, um, how we can bring resources to begin to, to stabilize the nervous system. And then James and Christy, hi there, you guys. Um, how can I not feel guilty if I'm having a good time or laughing? Yeah, so it's such a good question. And that's, and that is a, and that's a process. And I don't mean to say that as a way to not answer it because it's not, it's not the include, excuse me, it's not the exclusion of guilt and it's not the exclusion of laughing or having a good time. It's the holding of both. It's that there are parts of me, there is a part of me that feels guilty. And, and there is a part of me that is having fun and laughing and alive. And this is, this is not just um, in relationship to loss or traumatic loss, but it's in life is that how do we hold both? How do we hold the pain and how do we hold the joy? How do we hold the discomfort and how do we hold the comfort? How do we hold the peace? And how do we hold the uncertainty, right? Because life is mixed and life is always presenting both. It, life is not filled with that which we don't prefer, which we can probably all agree <laughs> on what we don't prefer. And we could always, pro all of us probably all agree on what we prefer in life. And so I would say to that, that it's, it's not the exclusion of the guilt um, and it's not the exclusion of the joy and the laughing, but it's, it's, it's holding both. I, if that, I don't know if that helped or if that made sense or if there's anything more I can clarify, but um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say about that. It's good to see your name. Thank you. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tish, she said uh, that feels, hi guys. Uh, that feels very consoling um, baby steps. So, okay. And then, oh, she just um, has a book recommendation if you wanna, um, in there. okay. How does this work with children? Yes. Okay. So it works the exact same. Their nervous systems are fluctuating and their nervous systems. And this, this is an important piece is that with this awareness of your nervous system, you can begin to see, or you can see what's happening in another person's nervous system, okay? So for example, when you see the restlessness, the agitation, um, the, the rigidity, you know, any of the hyper aroused um, states, I'm gonna just pull this up in case I miss, I know I'm missing some, hold on. Where did you go? Okay. Um, um, okay, so, oh, sorry, hold on one sec. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so, 
the hyperactivity, exaggerated startle, any of that, right? Or if we're also noticing in our children, the flat affect, lethargy, deadness, um, chronic fatigue, any of that. So I'm gonna share with you something that I actually just learned an, a couple of days ago. Um, I wasn't planning to, but I just, as, as this question was asked, this is really helpful, I think, just in general. Okay, so two things. So the first thing, this isn't what I learned. I wanna <laughs> slow myself down. I sometimes when, the, my, when my brain starts firing, I get a little excited and then I wanna share like 10 things at the same time. Um, so when we're looking at our children, we can gauge where they are in their, in their nervous system. And at this point, this is my view, is that unless your children are really interested in the nervous system, and this doesn't have to go with children, actually, this can go with a partner, your friends, your family, the person at the checkout counter, the person who's just cut you off, what state of the nervous system are they in? Okay, so just noticing that. Now, this is where I think it, I, it gets very interesting because people, our spouse, our partner, our family, our friends, our colleagues, our children, they regulate because we're mammals, because we're social beings, they actually regulate to our nervous system. That's like the good news and the bad news, right? So if my, if I am more in that normal range, that is going to elicit a nervous system to connect to my nervous system. Now, not all the time, right? I mean, if someone is really hyper aroused and I'm in a state of like normal range, it doesn't mean that's always gonna happen, but it's just more for like a framework. The same is true that if I am depressed, if I'm depressed or feeling a lot of exhaustion or fatigue, the person, child or not, is going to, is going to resonate with that as part of, uh, of my nervous system, okay? So as the parent kind of observing and watching this, right? And especially, you know, it's not even children, right? But anyone we love. And that is, so how do we help the, chi the child or the loved one who's in that state when we might be a little bit more resourced in that moment. And resourced, when I say resourced, I just mean like within the normal range. So this is what I just, uh, what I just learned. And I hope that I, I have it right. I was just looking for my notes. So I'm, I'm gonna go out on a ledge here, but I think this was just like, it really, really clicked. When someone is depressed, when someone has that flat affect, okay? Again, children or not, what they need, and I wanna be cautious about the prescription of need, but their energy is low and stuck. So for someone who loves them and watching them in this is that there's this the bringing in the quality of empathy, right? Like, I totally get this. This is really hard. I know what it feels like, right? That feeling of like, I can feel what you're feeling. I can feel there. I am right there with you in this, okay? The opposite is true. And you have, and there's, you know, there's nothing is ever like black and white and like totally clear and appropriate for everyone. So you'll have to get a feel for this. When someone is anxious or exaggerated or just kind of, you know, wound up, right? Their energy is already kind of roused. So their energy or their nervous system needs, again, needs more compassion, right? So a more settling back of like holding the space with like awareness, like, yes, I hear you. Yes, 
yes right that really that a little bit of distance not disconnect but distance for them to have their own experience rather than infusing it with that um kind of empathetic like yes i get it i get it i get it right it's more of like yes i understand and less of the um that kind of emotion the emotionality so that's how we can relate to our children and to people that we love when we notice where they are in the nervous system. I also want to say, and I was, it's, I was, it's, it's such an important point and one that I really think, um, I really think gets overlooked and doesn't um, come into the conversation very much. And that is this, this sense of titration, right? So if you see your child or someone you love who's in this depressive state and you're saying like, just exercise, right? That's going to add some energy. There can be a backlash to that. And if a body has been sedentary, going out and like moving your body a lot isn't going to feel good. And so what does that do? It's like, I am not going to go move my body again. So these like little movements, the little movements, and the same can be said, I mean, this happened all the time, all the time. And that is someone is in the hyper aroused state of feeling anxious. And we say, go meditate, go do mindfulness for like 20 minutes, go sit quiet. If you've ever been anxious and you're being told to go sit quietly, that is like sitting on like nails, like, no, thank you. That is exacerbating everything or go just relax. Like, has anyone ever told you like when you're really wound up, like go just relax. And it's kind of like, don't you think I would if I could, but I can't. So just to keep that in mind of like, you know, oh, so maybe we'll just go for a walk, right? Just a slower walk you know, that's a, that's a way. So, and I, I haven't gotten into like specifics, um, yet, and I will, um, in a, in a moment. So, um, does that Mary Jane answer your question? I know that it was a very long answer, but I wanted to include how that just worked with human beings as well. Yes, it did. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the share screen and see if I get this right. Okay, there we go. Oops, okay. You know what, actually, can we do something? Cause this is, and this is partly tracking. I'm just kind of modeling this because I'm tracking my own nervous system, right? So presenting, giving a lot of information, right? It's activating. Now I'm not outside of a normal range, but I can feel my energy, right? It's up, it's, you know, like my heart's racing a little fast. I'm you know, all the different things. And you're taking in a lot of information. I mean, this is a lot of information. So how, so this is how we can just use the practice, use a practice just to regulate together. So just taking a moment, right? And we, we're going to start again, just with noticing where you are. So just looking around the room, Noticing what you see. Noticing what you hear. And noticing just what's around you to touch. Again, that's just one of my personal favorites. Noticing what you smell. And noticing any taste in your mouth. And then you can stay just by looking or gazing, right? tuning into a sound, or we can just take it one step, add one or two more steps. 
And that is you can actually take your hand. So one hand to your heart option or just cross your right arm and then cross your left arm. So it's just kind of like you're making an X or you're also just kind of giving yourself a hug. And this is just to contain the energy, okay? And not containing that the energy that is arising is bad. It's just kind of giving it some boundaries, if you will. Okay. And you can have your eyes open or closed. And then you can stay here or you can just squeeze. So the squeezing helps just to add circulation. Okay, very simple. So even when we don't want to move, right? So Judy, this might be something that you want to just try, even if you're not crossing your arms, it's just to squeeze your arms, squeeze your hands, just very gentle. So adding some circulation and blood flow. Okay. And then you can stay squeezing if you'd like. You can also just rub up and down your arm a couple of times. You can rub your palms together. And then like you can, yeah, you can just let your hands rest in your lap and even just kind of move up and down your thighs a couple of times. And again, all this can be done with your eyes open or closed. And then just come back to yourself, come back to your inner body. Just notice how you feel. Okay. So we're going to come back to um, another slide. So hold on a moment. So here are, let me just move this real quick. Um, yeah, let me go back one, oops. Okay, sorry here, okay. So this is another framework with the nervous system. So you're familiar with the hyperarousal, the hypoarousal. You're also familiar with this, um, that kind of flexibility in the normal range with the yellow line. So this is also called the window of tolerance, okay? So I, I, I hesitate to say that the goal, our goal is always to be in the window of tolerance. It's to be in this grounded, flexible, open, curious, present state. Like that would be wonderful and, um, you know, especially when there's a lot of grief and traumatic, the traumatic loss that, you know, being in there all the time is, you know, not always possible. So that it's more of like, how do I want to say this? Like, it's more of like just a moving towards and dipping our toes in it and then coming out and then we'll most likely come out and then coming, dipping our toes back in and coming out and that it's a process. And that the more times we dip our toes and we make a choice. And this is where, this is where I think it, there becomes a diff, uh, that choice point and agency of like, when we're in a state of hyperarousal or hypoarousal, can I make a choice to dip my toe towards 
the normal, and I don't like the word normal, but for lack of not having a better word or going towards or into the window of tolerance, can I do something that brings me towards the window of tolerance, even if it's just for like five seconds? And then it's okay if you go back into the hypo or hyper arousal. It's just the, the nervous system beginning to, to regulate again. But what happens is, is that often we stay in the hyper or hypo arousal or we stay going you know, kind of up and down and we don't know what our choices are or we think we have to do the exact opposite. So in the next slide, um, what can we do to come back into the window of tolerance? And these are some, some suggestions, some just practical su suggestions, right? To find stability, right? Survivors can begin tracking their windows so they can self-regulate. So awareness, where are you in your nervous system? Are you hyper or hypo? Are you fluctuating? And just to name it, there's a saying, I can't, uh, I don't know, it's I, who, I don't know who I, I should, uh, I would think it's like Dan Siegel, which he's a neurobiologist, but he says, name it and tame it. Although I don't think it comes from that, but it doesn't really matter. But it's like, name it and tame it. So when you name what's happening, it actually begins it's like a self-soothing, self-regulating, um, uh, um, self-regulating in that it's like, if you name what's happening, it's like, oh, okay. All right. My mind is super active. Okay. It's ruminating. Okay. It has a tendency to actually begin to, to regulate. Mindfulness, stay in the here and now. Mindfulness, not in the sense of sitting in a cross-legged position and looking completely peaceful and blissed out because that's just not the case for, for a lot of human beings. And that is mindful of the moment. Okay, I am right here, right now. And that was the resourcing. I can feel my feet on the ground. Okay, I'm right here. Very simple. I can feel my hands on the grocery cart. Okay, I can see the sky. I can hear the music. Okay. So mindfulness and just presence in the here and now. Breathing. So there's a lot about breathing. Just breathe. Take a deep breath. That is, that is true. And I want to say this because I think that this is like, you know, if you read anything about anything in terms of mindfulness, anything in terms of relaxation, let me just check the time. I'm sorry. I don't know where we are and I want to, okay. Um, oops, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Hold, um, can you still see it? Um, hold on. One. Yeah, we can still see it. If you hit play from current slide, it'll just go back to your, to the, okay. yeah, that Thank you, Emily. Everyone needs an Emily in their life. <laughs> okay. Um, breathing. And that is, um, okay. So what I was saying is, is that there, yes, there's uh, deep breathing, take a deep breath, belly breath, breathe, breathe, breathe. And yes, it is directly linked to the nervous system. So that is true. And when we are in a hyper or hypo state, the breath is not always the safest place or the most effective place to regulate the nervous system. It can actually exacerbate certain, certain symptoms of hyper or hypo arousal, okay? So, so what I like to say is, what, and, and when you're just beginning with the breath, is just to feel your body breathing just as it is, not doing anything about your breath. And that might still be too much, okay? So let's just take a moment, I'm just because we're talking about the breath and just, again, eyes open or closed and just notice what it feels like just to let your body breathe just as it is. Just as it is.
And if your eyes were open, you're welcome to open them. If your eyes were open, and just stay here. Yeah, so just notice what that felt like. And then physical activity, and we've talked a little bit about physical activity, but physical activity does not need to be extreme or, you know, the, the, you know, I'm going to now exercise for an hour a day. Physical activity, and actually, I'm glad this is coming up. This is a very effective movement and that is to shake your body so if you look at animals who have just been attacked in nature what they do to regulate their nervous system and come back to homeostasis is they shake right they shake so literally shaking is both hyper or hypo aroused right just to shake the body so that the stagnation or the stuckness of the nervous system has energy to move okay Physical activity can be something as, also as simple as just flexing and moving your hands and your fingers and your toes. One of my favorites, and I wish I did it more, is to dance, just to put some music on and just to sway your body. And of course, all the other just kind of more um, common ways, but physical activity um, it is very, very helpful. And if physical activity isn't your thing, that's okay too. Remember that there are other ways, like the simplicity of flexing and um, extending your, your feet or your hands, that's physical activity. And if you are feeling hypo aroused and there's not much movement, just very, very simple things of just like moving your head slowly. You can move slowly and that counts as physical activity. And then soothing your senses, right? So going through your senses, this is a really helpful, you know, soft things that are soft for me, right? And, you know, I like things that are soft, that are soothing to the eyes or smells, things that you enjoy smelling or um, hearing, you know, music or um, uh, friendships, right? Good people, right? People's voices can be really, really helpful. So just going through kind of the senses and thinking about what you enjoy it doesn't have to be something, you know, real extravagant by anything. And then challenge, challenge your thoughts, or even just write your thoughts down, just, I, I you know, in bubbles. Um, this could just be a whole session in itself about thoughts and journaling, writing things down. And this isn't for everybody, but it's for some people and it can be really, really helpful. So, um, so yeah, so these are just some of the, some of the ways that we can bring ourselves back into the, to the window of, of tolerance. Um, so, okay. So, the one piece that is kind of towards the end, however, um, we did talk about it um, in relationship to the question about children, and that's the relational aspect of the nervous system and the social engagement system. Um, and that I'm gonna just, um, un I think, oh wait, um, how do I unshare, <laughs> whoops. Um, wait, I'm kind of lost here. Hold on one second, okay. Um, oh. Emily, can you help me? How do I, um, oops. You just want to stop your screen share? Yeah. It should be the menu at the top. It should say pause or. Oh, yes, you're so good. You're like, you knew exactly what I was looking at. Okay. Um, so um, the social engagement system and uh, the, the connection is that when I was speaking earlier about the, um, the way that we can be in one part of our nervous system and then someone can be in another part of their nervous system. And often when we're in different parts of our nervous system and more of a, in more of the hyper or hypo and out of the range is that then we're clashing with the other nervous system, which causes conflict or tension. And so 
And the reason I think that that's so important is that if we just notice where we are in our own nervous system and can identify where someone else is in their nervous system, the, the best that we can do for both people is to make an effort. And I don't see, I don't mean efforting in the sense of like, you know, that striving, but just, um, making a good faith effort to bring ourselves, ourselves into the window of tolerance. Because when we're in that state, then it is actually helps the other person be able to come into their state. And so it's like, by taking care of ourselves, not in a selfish way, but in a genuine care for our well being, but also for the well being of those that we love, it actually is of service to both. It's of service to both. And so, um, so I, I bring this to the, to the table so that we can see that where we are in relationship to others and how when we're both in a certain state, it can exacerbate where we each are in the nervous system. And we can also be the conduit or the bridge to, um, to being helpful for those that we love and care for. So here we are. I, um, and I, I'd like to open it up for questions or comments. I know we only have like five minutes left, but I'm in no hurry whatsoever. So if more people have questions, I'm, I'm welcome to stay. Um, so I'll just start with opening the floor to the chat or to the Zoom. And you can just jump in if you have a question. I don't know if there are any hands raised. But... Patty just asked a question. The social engagement systems, when do they clash again? So they, cla they clash when either when we're out of our um, we're out of our range. So if I'm hyper aroused, I'm anxious and irritable. And then the person who I'm in, I'm relating with, they're also hyper aroused and irritable. You have two hyper aroused people communicating, which never is never really a good idea, right? So if you're aware of like, oh, I'm hyper aroused, the person I'm in relationship with or I'm relating with is in hyper arousal, how, what can I do to bring myself back into the window of tolerance? When you're in the window of tolerance, then there's clarity, groundedness, ease. And so there's, um, there's more ease to communicate. And when you're in the um, window of tolerance. And I don't know if they're exactly compatible. I don't know if they would say the experts or the researchers would say the window of tolerance and the social engagement system are the same thing. So I just wanna be um, cognizant of that. But when we are regulated, it is also the regulating of our nervous system that helps to regulate that of another person's nervous system just by being regulated ourselves. So you, uh, so when, so when you talk to someone and someone's like, da -da 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 -da, you know, like speaking a lot or kind of anxious, right? And you notice how that feels in your body opposed to someone who is, is calm and centered and grounded, you also notice how that feels in your body and you regulate um, to that person, not intentionally, but subconsciously you do. 
Um, and then also the same can be true for if two people are in hypo arousal, like tired, right? I mean, this is actually, this is, I think really helpful. I mean, even just in my own life is that when I'm super tired and I'm like, you know, just kind of like, oh, that's not always the best time for me to communicate, right? Or to be engaged with someone, right? I need to either like number one, sleep, or number two, I need to, to, to raise my energy up a little bit and, and into that kind of, into that window of tolerance so that I can more effectively communicate. So, so that's how um, I was um, relating it. I hope that asks, answers your question, Patty. And if not, you can, um, um, you can follow up with the question. Um, Okay, so um, Edward, uh, um, some experts, oh wait, uh, okay. Some experts say that we should just let ourselves grieve and feel at all kinds of feelings. By attempting to return to the window of tolerance, will, be, will we be limiting our ability to grieve due to trauma? That's such a great question. Um, such a great question. I, and there is sacred space and time that needs, in my opinion, devoted to grief and to really allowing ourselves to feel the depth of the loss and what it means to our heart, but also to our life. And there's the and, and we're also living human beings that have responsibilities and jobs and relationships and things we have to do. So the window of tolerance does not mean from my perspective to exclude the grief but rather as, as just an avenue or a way to make life just a little bit easier and manageable in the complexity and in the depth of, um, of such pain. Um, yeah, so, and we, and I, you know, I, I, I really, and, and grief, and we all know this, and it comes in phases and stages. And when we don't give ourselves to, to the, to the grief, it can get stuck too. It can, it can get stuck, and it shows up at different times in our lives. And I think, do we, you know. Um, to be witnessed in our grief and to be held in our grief. Um, I, I, I wish that our culture would hold each other more kindly with our grief. Yeah, so sorry, Edward, I'm, I'm kind of moving into a whole nother conversation that I am interested in, but I hope that answers your question. And if it doesn't, answer your question, please reach out to me because I would be happy to have a, a deeper conversation about this. Okay, hold on one second. Um, okay, Megan, uh, you can integrate the conflicting emotions, how I heard what you said, not denying the emotions, but regulating and the perspective of inclusion, of inclusion. I'm also a very feeling person. You know, I'm very like, I'm, I'm just born highly sensitive. So the thought of having to exclude like feelings is just like, you know, like taking the oxygen out or the breath away from me. So, um, so yeah. So it's hold it's holding both. It's including always about inclusion for me and befriending, getting to know. Yeah. Carly, I did just see one more question in the chat. Um, okay. That was a little, if I can find it, that was a little further up. Oh yeah, um, Emily. 
yeah, uh, just the, just as any suggestions on how to motivate ourselves to use some of these helpful um, ideas and, and information. That's a good question. Yeah, yes, okay. I'm sorry, I took the deep breath and I was like, yes. So yeah, it's just start with what is easiest. Starts with what's easiest. Start with what is calling to you. And it doesn't have to make any sense, even if it wasn't on the list. If it's just picking up a book and reading a couple of sentences, or, you know, I'm a big one for looking at the sky. I don't, you know, that like it just do what calls you. And you don't owe an explanation to anybody for what works and what doesn't work. And just start that way. And just in little doses, I'm also a, a, a huge proponent of titration. And again, just little small doses. And I like to think of it as like medicine, like tinctures of medicine. That's um, yeah. And ask for help at, you know, I, I'm, I just ask who's ever listening, <laughs> please, you know, send down what I'm supposed to. And I think when we do things little by little and we do things that we enjoy and that bring us just a little bit of comfort, um, I think it, it continues down of more, um, yeah, of, of more joys and um, ease. And it doesn't mean that disease or discomfort doesn't arise. Yeah, Dee, I see your name. Uh, yes, I, um, I this question that I, uh, did you see it, Emily, or did I? Yes, so I have it pulled up. It says, you mentioned deep breathing can exasperate hyperarousal. So when waking up in the middle of the night with pulse racing from a bad dream, what do you suggest to do to calm the nervous system down? Yeah, um, so it depends. And I say that because I don't want to just like, think that I have the answer, um, but I can get how I, I could give a couple of, I could give a couple of suggestions. Um, and that is, you know, I, I, I always am, you know, the, 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 the practices or the tools I give are always what I do in my own life. So it's not, you know, I, I often share, which is also what works for me. Um, and one thing is, and like I said, I'm a big person for putting hands on the body. So just feeling my, feeling my body, um, very, very helpful. And again, that, that hug and just squeezing, you know, I also, I forget about this noggin of mine, but this noggin is like often, you know, where so many of my thoughts are and just putting hands on your head. It's just like, you know, every time I put my hands on my head, even now I'm doing it, I'm like, oh, you know, my head's saying like, why don't you pay more attention to me? <laughs> you know, like, why don't you care for me a little bit more? Um, now, deep breathing might work for you. So I don't want to say don't do deep breathing. But what I would say that this could be helpful is just to put your hands on your abdomen. If you don't, you know, and if putting your hands on your abdomen doesn't feel good, then don't worry about that. And just noticing the abdomen rise and fall with the breath. Okay, just super simple, super simple. Um, and then the last option, the last thing is that if you, if, hopefully you can um, see me, but you just, you literally, you just start tapping your finger, your, your thumb to your pointer, your middle finger, your ring finger, your pinky, and then the other, and you just keep going back and forth. And what this does is it helps to bring your mind to center. It's also a right brain, left brain um, integration, but that it doesn't matter that that's what's happening. It doesn't even matter how you do it. You can come up with any pattern that you like, but those are kind of the three things that I would say. And I know that, you know, you most of us have heard this, you know, not to go on your phone to, you know, that like check emails or whatever, that that just the, the screen and everything. And, you know, if you do that, that's okay too. But they do say that that's, um, that can just prolong it. So I hope that that helps give you some options. Um, and if it doesn't, um, you can always reach out to me. I, I would be happy to, 
brainstorm with you. So yeah, so just um, for sake of time, and now the recording is going to be a little bit longer, but I hope you all um, learned something and um, are able to take some information away. And um, the lot you can always reach me through loss. So thank you for being here. And many blessings to you.